Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our ESEA office hour for August 13th. We hope you folks have found some time to enjoy a little bit of the beautiful weather that we tend to be having across the state, but also know that you are well in preparation modes to begin a new school year and to think about everything associated with ESEA. So we just wanted to jump in with a number of items that we wanted to draw to your attention. All right, we'll start out with everyone's favorite topic, which is <laughs> FY25 ESEA monitoring. Um, if you haven't noticed already, there's a grant award notification in your FY25 application. And within that GAN, you should be able to find the monitoring status for your district. For SAUs that are identified as needing medium and high levels of support, those are the ones who will complete the monitoring instrument in grants for me. And we're having a training on what that means and what that looks like on September 10th at 3 p.m. Uh, I'm assuming one of my colleagues right now is probably dropping that link in the chat for you so you can register for that training because this is going to be a training that we need to have folks signed up for ahead of time so we can keep track of who's been trained and maybe who we still need to reach out to give that additional support to. So again, we're doing a monitoring training for those identified at a medium and high level on September 10th, and you can find that right in your GAN, what monitoring level you are at. All right, second quick update. Uh, we've gotten a message from a few folks when they're turning in their application that they're getting uh, this sort of top, top screenshot that says the MDOE director reviewer final approval could not be found. The short answer or what you need to know here is that this doesn't really affect what's going on with your application. You can hit submit and it will still come to us as your ESCA regional program managers to review your application. The longer story is that the system is based on, you know, grants for me is based on a much larger platform used across the country and something on the back end was changed that's now causing this message to appear. Rest assured, you have someone who's reviewing your application and if you ever need to forget or you're new and need to know who your regional program manager is, one way you can look that up is by going to your address book, looking under the ESEA section and looking at your program consultant. All right, and the last update I have to share with you all folks is that we've recently made some robust updates to the Title IIA spending snapshot. Uh, these can all be found on our website. And again, I'm going to bet one of my colleagues is going to put this in the chat shortly. Uh, but what I've done here is try to take all the things in the last few years since I've come on board as the Title II coordinator, all those things that we've talked about really in these meetings, and put them in one place that's in written form for everyone. So we've just sort of added a lot of the guidance that we've been talking about in these meetings to that Title IIA spending snapshot. Really shouldn't be any major surprises there, but just wanted to alert folks to that written guidance now being available for all of you. So we also wanted to draw to your attention a new process that we are utilizing in our uh, ESEA data collection. We are collecting all of the equitable service data that we need for Title I through a process that we use collectively as a department. So this is allowing us to al align our data collection a little bit more closely with the main Department of Education. So we are encouraging our ESEA coordinators and our non-public schools to attend a specialized training that is related just to the information that we need for Title I equitable services. This is uh, a component of data sets that will be utilized for FY26 equitable services under Title I. So it's really important that everyone is familiar with the process, that our non-public school officials are entering in the data in that enrollment report. So we are asking our ESEA coordinators to share this information with their non-public schools and also attend September 11th at 10.30 a.m. And I'm sure one of my colleagues is dropping that link right in the chat box as well for all of you folks to be able to attend and support the data collection that will be utilized for FY26 Title I Equitable Services. Great. <clears throat> Uh, we just wanted to, the Title I team, actually just before she went out, uh, had finalized sort of a kind of a guidance on poverty data resources. 
uh, again, you know, it's important to know your options and where they come from. And of course, then we held a training, I think at this point now, probably a year or so ago, um, or even longer than that, because of how we had changed as a state, our process with district allocation. So all of that information is there. Um, and so I'll drop that PDF there. Um, and that is now on the guidance page as well. Uh, this is a friendly reminder because um, your Title I school-wide plans for your school-wide programs are really a, kind of the North Star of everything ESCA when you're a school-wide program for Title I. Um, your school needs a assessment pages really should be very strong summaries of your annual updates that have been made to the school-wide plans. Um, they must include data analysis for relevant subgroups. When we monitor for school-wide plans and when I accept new school-wide applications for schools turning into school-wide programs, this has been really the crux of what I have seen, uh, of what I haven't seen as much of, and this is directly in statute. So it's just incredibly important that when you have school-wide plans and when you're thinking about how to improve sort of in a comprehensive way your school's programming, you are still centering the students that are most at risk of failing and you're still looking at particular subgroup data. So for economically disadvantaged, multilingual learners, special education students, and students from any major ethnic racial groups. I have there the word relevant because I understand certain districts may have less or more, but it's always really important to understand how those students are doing in relation to their counterparts or their non-economically disadvantaged students, for example, in order for you to really understand if your interventions and things that you're targeting for them are really helping. Um, that is really then the crux of how you can use your funds in a consolidated way. As you know, on those project pages, you put how you meet the intent and purpose of those titles, but you can use those funds more flexibly. So this is kind of a really big deal. And I just want to start seeing, I think we'll do, you know, hopefully um, we'll have some more direct school-wide um, guidance and resources when Jess comes back, maybe a start of spring next year. Um, but in the meantime, as you're working on your ESCA applications, please use your school-wide plans as your North Star. And it really should be obvious in the summary of your application that the analysis has taken place um, and that you have considered um, your highest needs. So speaking of ESEA funding applications, um, just a friendly reminder for folks that the FY25 application uh, opened a few weeks ago. Um, the submission deadline has now passed. Um, that was August 1st. So um, if you find yourself in a situation where you've not yet fully submitted that application, uh, please be sure that you're uh, working toward achieving that goal. Uh, just a reminder here in terms of how to access the application. It is located within our Grants for Me uh, grant management system. And you can find it by following the, the breadcrumb trail here on the slide, uh, funding, funding applications, and then you want to select 2025 from your uh, drop down menu that shows up. Now, if you're one of our handful of school districts across the state that gets very minimal funding or for whom the uh, idea of completing the application um, simply isn't worth it in comparison to the amount of funding you would receive, you do have the option to uh, refuse funds. And that's basically at the same level um, where you're in a status of not started. Um, and you can either change your application to a status of draft started to begin completing it. Or if you're opting out of accepting ESEA funds, you would just click that ESEA funds refused link. Um, and that would basically null and void your application for that um, FY25 fiscal year. Another quick reminder for folks, uh, if again, you've maybe submitted your application, but you're, um, you still ha don't have uh, substantial or final approval at this point, be sure that you're checking the consultant checklist within the application for feedback on things that may need to be updated, amended, uh, what have you, in order to obtain substantial or final approval. When you pull up that checklist, you may encounter a situation where you're you're just seeing a list of items that say, um, okay, needs attention, what have you. Anything flagged with needs attention, be sure that you're clicking the little plus arrow next to that item because each of those text boxes are expandable. 
And so when you do that, you'll be able to see whatever feedback, written comments have been provided by your regional program manager. And it should give you some fairly concrete uh, next steps in order to resolve that item uh, in an effort to, again, get uh, substantial or final approval. So as we talk about different approval levels for the FY25 application, it is really important to be cognizant of the difference between substantial and final approval. Uh, substantial approval is essentially the, the minimum level of approval that anyone would need in order to begin obligating funds for expenses. And when I say obligate, I basically mean enter into any sort of uh, written agreement to procure a good or a service. Um, so substantial approval is really important in that regard because it's essentially the date that you can begin entering into contracts or paying for services, things like that with your FY25 funds. So again, if you don't yet have that substantial approval, be sure that you're looking at the consultant checklist to see what you need to uh, update as far as your application is concerned so that you can obtain substantial approval. Um, we do have some additional resources on our website. Um, I'll throw that in the chat right now um, so that folks have access to that page. Um, but Rita, if you can move forward, I'll just kind of get those other pieces here. So if you're new to your role, um, if you're not exactly sure how to go about completing the ESC application, you know, if you're maybe with one of the 60 or so districts uh, that currently have an application somewhere in process right now, uh, and you're not sure how to move forward, we strongly encourage folks to view our resources uh, page on our website. We have a number of different training videos to help folks through the process of completing the application. Uh, but of course, if you ever are just at a standstill, if you need support, you're more than welcome to reach out to one of us um, uh, as your regional program managers. Uh, for assistance in being able to um, move that application forward and uh, obtain substantial and ultimately final approval. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just a few housekeeping um, tips for the fiscal corner. Uh, one is that currently I am uh, back to two weeks for turnaround on invoicing uh, due to the fact that I've been out. Um, I am going to try to get that caught up this week. Also, a reminder that just because you have substantial approval on your FY25 application, you will not be able to submit any invoices until you have final approval. Um, I do want to reiterate that if you do not have substantial approval, you should not be entering any contracts now until you do get that substantial approval um, date. Also be mindful of the period of performance of the grant. Uh, some subscriptions, licenses, um, programs even, come with one, three, or six years of access, we can only pay for the access that falls within the period of performance of the grant. Go ahead. Invoicing, this is just your friendly reminder, uh, always has to be reasonable, necessary, and allocable. Uh, important dates are your substantial approval date and period of performance. Salary and benefits, I am still getting invoices that are only requesting salaries and not the associated benefits. <clears throat> you must include both salaries and benefits uh, when requesting reimbursement for one or the other. This is also true when splitting an invoice to use up old funds. So you're gonna have the same period service period on both invoices, um, but you cannot say charge FY23 all the salaries and then charge FY24 all of the benefits. They must be split and they must appear on both invoices. 
Friendly reminder, accrued salaries and benefits cannot be reimbursed until they are paid out. So just, just keep that in mind. Uh, grants for me error messages. Again, the budget in the application informs the budgeted categories on the invoicing side. And just because you are getting an error message saying the, that you cannot ask for more than, let's say $1,000 in benefits, um, you just throw that into a category that you do have funds remaining. We, we cannot accept that. You need to do a budget revision in the application, have it approved by your regional program manager, and then submit uh, the invoice. And here is a reminder of what is currently open to invoice and what is closing relatively quickly here. Um, so your FY22 ESEA consolidated funds will expire on 9-30-24. That means that you um, will have until December 30th to um, liquidate the funds, but you cannot obligate any funds after 9-30-24. Same with the... Um, Tier three school improvement funds for FY23. So just, just a reminder, get those invoices in so we can um, spend down those grants. Uh, this is a reminder that the federal fiscal office hours will commence on September 26. And this is for anyone who manages federal funds or federal programs. Uh, we, we provide excellent information and it is across all federal grants here at the um, Department of Education. If you have a suggestion for a topic, please get that to either myself or your federal fiscal team by September 1st. As usual, we just wanted to leave you with this slide that indicates uh, where to get some more information about professional learning throughout the department. We also have some information in regards to our contacts. You will see that Jeanette and I are serving as interim contacts while our colleague Jess is out until the middle of September. So if you are in Aroostook or Kennebec, please note that you will have an interim contact until the middle of September. And here is also where you can find all information related to the main Department of Education and all of our social platforms. And we are gonna stop sharing the screen and open it up to some questions that we may not have been able to get to in the chat box.